I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we move on from the conspiracy and look at the evidence in the Karen Reed case. everybody and welcome to this episode of the prosecutors i'm brett and i'm joined as always by my uniting co-host alice uniting Bring us together alice i was gonna say you know what i didn't know was a bad word or a divisive word there are lots of words that i know get people's hairs all you know on their ends the word conspiracy apparently <laughs> is one of the most divisive words possible when talking about this case. For those of you who have it's missed true. our eight hours of episodes so far, I don't know how many hours, but it feels like many, many hours of episodes. We are using the term conspiracy quite literally in the legal sense. And also we are presenting the conspiracy as called as such by the defense because this is what is presented at trial. So those of you who may not have followed us before when we follow these trials we've done, Lots of trials. Murdaugh one, being one of the longest ones <laughs> that almost sent us all over the edge because of its length. We are presenting to you quite literally what's happening in trial and explaining what's happening because a lot of these streamed televised trials are just that. There's not anyone kind of explaining to you what's happening in the sidebars, what's happening with the objections, what the judge is doing in these rulings, what is allowed to be testified upon and what's not. So when we use the term conspiracy, I am not trying to come at you with a divisive sword. Nay, not at all. I'm quite literally telling you what the defense's theory is. With that, Brett, shall we be a bit more divisive? Sure. And I just want to make it very clear. I am coming at you with a sword. If you believe a conspiracy, I'm going to call what you believe a conspiracy and you need to own it. Don't run away from it. Own it. But fortunately, here in episode seven, we are finally ending the discussion of the conspiracy and getting to the evidence. And before we do that, I do want to note one thing. It is a problem, in my view, that it has taken us six episodes to get to this point. I think it is a problem for how the Commonwealth presented this case. And one piece of advice I often give to lawyers, which is probably a bad piece of advice, you, know, you get a brief or you see an argument the defense is going to make, and a lot of people want to meet the defense on their ground. They want to tailor their response to be you know, a point-by-point -point refutation to what the defense is saying. And what I often tell people, when you do that, you have decided you are going to cede the ground to them. You have already given them an air of believability because you're willing to entertain their arguments. And I always tell people, much better present your case, know their argument, think the way they're thinking, but present your case. And while doing that, you can rebut their arguments. But don't just make it about them. And what you saw in this case was the prosecution decided that what they were going to spend the first half of this case on, at least, was putting on witnesses who were part of the defense's conspiracy. And so, rather than presenting their own case, they initially attempted to rebut this conspiracy and then moved on to the evidence. And I think that was a major mistake. Absolutely. We always say play on your turf, not their turf, right? And so we won't jump ahead to what may happen in the future. But what we're getting to do right now, being a little bit after the trial, is getting to look at things with 2020 hindsight. So with that, Brett, jump in, because we ended with quite the bombshell witness last time, Carrie Roberts, and bombshell in the sense that we said she was a real problem for the defense. I still stand by that. She's a real problem for the defense because she was there with, who are we talking about today? Karen Reed. <laughs> she was there with <laughs> Karen Reed. <laughs> Y'all, you think I'm spicy? McCabe. It's just starting. <laughs> and Jen McCabe, the three of them were there when John was discovered in the snow, or so we think. That was the first time he was discovered. But for purposes of this timeline, she's there. But 
she's not part of the theory of the conspiracy. And that's difficult because she's one third of the people who are there. But there are more witnesses. Yeah. And she really is a transition point for the prosecution. And we will touch on the conspiracy as we go forward because we have to talk about Brian Higgins. We have to talk about Trooper Proctor. But really what we're going to see is a lot of witnesses that are more about did Karen Reed do this or not? For us, I think, as we've said, after Carrie Roberts, we're pretty much done with the conspiracy. I don't believe the conspiracy happened. And so my focus going forward, and I think what we should think about going forward, are two things. Number one, does the prosecution meet its burden for these three charges, murder two, and then this sort of drunken accident, homicide, and leaving the scene? And if they don't, well, if they don't, did the defense create reasonable doubt? And what is that reasonable doubt? So that's what I want people to think about going forward. I know everybody likes talking about the conspiracy, but... I think we're conspiracy out, and you probably should be too. So let's get down to the brass tacks. And we're going to do that first by going back to Aruba. Because Aruba seems to be the point the prosecution wants to point to as the time when things really started falling apart for John and Karen. And they called Laura Sullivan to begin this discussion. Now, Laura was in Aruba around New Year's in 2021, over into 2022. And John was very close to her. He was the godfather of her son. The father of that child had been his partner before his suicide. So John had supported Laura afterwards. Laura knew that John had been dating Karen for a while, but she didn't actually meet her until Aruba. Now, John had spent the 31st watching Alabama play Cincinnati. Roll Tide, John, wherever you are. At some point, Reed was under the impression that John was cheating on her with Laura's sister. John said that, Reed was crazy, and her sister Marietta said that didn't happen. When he was asked if he was happy, John said, it is what it is, which is not how you want a relationship described, particularly your own vacation. This should be a happy time, but instead, they're fighting. So then the prosecution calls Marietta Sullivan. Now, Marietta had seen John at the pool as he was watching this football game in Aruba, and he was like a big brother to her. She said he gave her a big hug, and a few minutes later, she heard John's name screamed loudly, and someone yelled, who the F is that? This was Karen, who had seen them together and was very upset. Now, John told Karen to calm down, which is never a good idea, but that's what he did, and that it was Laura's sister. Marietta told Karen, nice to meet you, at which point Karen said she could go F herself, at which point Marietta said, F you too, which <laughs> is... <laughs> Quite the response, but you can see this Aruba trip it was not a happy trip for John and Karen, and it sort of underlies these ongoing concerns about their relationship and questions about whether or not everybody was being faithful in this relationship, which is going to be something we discuss more when we talk about Brian Higgins. Absolutely. So it doesn't just stop there with the allegations against Marietta with respect to maybe fidelity here. Brian Higgins, we've heard his name a lot. Remember, he is the ATF agent. He went to the bar that night with his good friend, Brian Albert. Now, Higgins considered both John and Karen friends, and he would text with them, communicate with them. He was friendly with them. In fact, he and Karen Reed exchanged flirty texts. Everything was fun that night. He never saw either of them at the Alberts' home. And he said he hung out that night with Brian when he went to the Albert home. And Brian showed him some photos of his sons in the Marine Corps because he was proud. And Brian Higgins testified he left between 1230 and 1 a.m. He didn't stay long at the house at all. In fact, he said because of this big storm that was coming in, he went to the police station in order to move the official police cars out of the way to make plowing easier. And after moving the cars, he got home around 1.40 a.m. The next day, he testified that his phone was blowing up with the news. The news, of course, now we know of John O'Keefe being found outside the Albert home. Higgins turned over all the germane text between him, John, and Karen to the police. And, you know, we'll get into some of these texts later, but they were pretty innocuous. They were definitely flirtatious with Karen, but 
there was really nothing exciting about these texts other than that. There was no and, kill uh, John for me. There's so we could no be kill John or luring John to some sort of death trap sort of situation. They were pretty boring texts about hanging out that night. Now, of course, we know that the lead investigator, Mike Proctor, is going to come up in the questioning, and he does. And Brian Higgins testified he knew Proctor, but only because they had worked on a case together before. That's pretty typical. You're going to have cross-jurisdictional work, and that's how he knew him. Now, prior to the order to preserve phones from the court, Higgins would get a new phone. Remember, this is like years ago, right? I don't know about you guys, but that's pretty typical in the phone era to get new phones. And when he did so, he destroyed his old phone. It wasn't in violation of the order because the order to preserve phones wasn't in effect at the time. And he said that he threw it away at a military base. Which, of course, you know, is is one of the parts of the conspiracy theory we've talked about a lot. I think Brian Higgins knew exactly what he was doing. I think he really didn't want the defense to get hold of his phone. Not necessarily because he was involved in a conspiracy, though that's a possibility, but just because he probably didn't want to turn his phone over to people he knew were going to try and destroy his life and include him in a frame job for a murder. And I think this is one of those things where I totally get it. Destroying your phone is a suspicious thing, and I can see people pointing to that as a suspicious thing, and I totally get that. But I would just note that what do we always say when somebody is accused of a crime? I mean, people will tell you, don't cooperate with the police when your kids disappear because you don't want the police to be able to frame you. But for some reason, when it's a defense attorney who wants your phone, all of a sudden, if you're not being cooperative, it's a problem. I wish Brian Higgins hadn't done this because I think it would have been easier to debunk the conspiracy if he hadn't. But only one of the possibilities is he did this because there was something incredibly incriminating on his phone. And I would just note, once again, Jen McCabe's phone ended up with the police. They had her phone. They were able to search it completely. If she is the linchpin to the conspiracy, which I think most people who believe in the conspiracy think she is, you would expect there would have been things from her and Brian Higgins that Brian Higgins couldn't hide by destroying his own phone. So I understand why people focus on this, but I don't think it's as important as people want it to be. That's a fair point. They do have access to a lot of phones and they have access to a lot of texts as well. Obviously, you can, you know, you can delete texts, whatnot, but you are usually able to see holes. I will just put myself out there as someone who is not that I know of currently part of a conspiracy and intent and knowledge is part of the conspiracy factors. So the fact that I don't know that I'm part of one means I'm probably not a part of one right now. All to say is I've been through a lot of phones in, let's just say the last 10 years I've been an attorney. And I know many like iPhones or Amazon, they give you trade in value for your phones. I've never in 10 years traded my phone in once. I've never tried to get the $20, $100, whatever value. I, probably being paranoid or that I work in the law and just don't want people to have access to my identity. And by the way, I just had to close down another bank account because someone defrauded the bank under my name and my social security number. Because I know of all these identity theft issues, I've kept all of my phones and I've destroyed all of them. And when I say I destroy, I use a hammer and I quite literally like go ballistic on my phone because I know the dangers of what happens when my phone, which it's very difficult to hard wipe a phone, gets in the wrong hands. That's why I personally have done that. And I know I'm not the only one. So I just put I that out there. I have never turned traded in a phone in. either. Okay. I'm with you so, 100%. So other people might, I'm only offering this as a counterpoint to everyone who says, if you destroy a phone, there must be some ulterior motive or that you're hiding something. There are lots of reasons not to. And I would say because of the concern a lot of people have with their privacy and with identity theft, many people choose to go that route. Enough of that. So we talked about how Brian Higgins and Karen were flirtatious in their texts. So she referred to herself as the weed whacker and she texted them that specifically that he was hot. So this is not like implied flirting. It was pretty overt flirting. And Brian asked if she was messing with him because she obviously knew that Karen was with John. Karen responded that she was serious and he replied, well, the feeling is mutual. In fact, it wasn't just flirtation by text. He testified that Karen kissed him as he was leaving John's home on January 15th. So a little bit before 
the events of this night. And it didn't stop there. The texting continued. Reed texted Higgins, quote, we're single and we don't have kids. We can do whatever we want. She told him that, quote, things had deteriorated with John. So these are all Karen's own words. Yeah. And you should listen to Higgins' testimony. We're truncating it a little bit because we're trying to get through some of this. But it's interesting. He obviously has some value to the defense, but it's not great for Karen, particularly this part. Now, the defense is going to try and turn this as Higgins had become obsessed with Karen. And, and possibly this is a motive for what happened to John. He was attacking John to get rid of him. It doesn't really explain why everyone else would be involved in that attack, but nevertheless, that is sort of one of their theories. But I think one thing the prosecution wants this to show is the relationship with Karen and John was on the rocks. It wasn't great. They weren't doing well. In fact, she was looking for others. And this notion of the kids being a problem is something that's going to come up again and again and again. And in fact, we hear from John's children after this testimony of Brian Higgins. This makes me very sad that they had to testify. So John's children, who are minors, testified. They essentially testified that the relationship between John and Karen was rocky. And John had said to the kids, this relationship had run its course and it wasn't healthy. John's niece talked about how Karen was frantic the morning in question. She said that Karen called multiple people in those early hours, and Karen was saying to the niece that she and John had a fight. She told one person over the phone that she thought she may have hit John, but the niece testified that as Karen called more and more people throughout that morning, her story changed. Eventually, her story would change to the fact that she worried a snowplow had hit John. So you can see why the niece really did have to testify. I mean, she was next to Karen as all of this was taking place. And she's the one who can testify to kind of the evolution of Karen's story that morning before John's body had been found. And I can only imagine how terrible this was for her. She's a child. She's in a situation where this person that she knows as someone who loves her father is frantic in the morning, probably woke her up, did wake her up, I mean, that's part of the story. She woke her up because she needed her to call Jim McCabe is telling her that, you know, the only father she's ever known has been hit by a snowplow. It's horrific. And we talked about this before, but this is incredibly unusual. And you can tell why this is important. As we said, we're starting to get into the evidence against Karen. Karen Reed, if her story is to be believed, dropped John off at a party after a night of drinking. The natural thing to assume at 5 o'clock in the morning if you wake up and he's not there is he's drunk at the party where he got dropped off. He's probably passed out on a couch. That's the thing to assume. Even if you're mad at him, you're not going to assume that he's been hit. You're certainly not going to assume that you hit him. You're not going to assume that a snowplow hit him. Why would you think that he was out in the blizzard getting hit by a snowplow? There's no reason for you to think that. But that's the first thing that comes to mind to her when she wakes up that morning and John hasn't come home, is that John is dead. That is a really unusual thing to think. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that most of you, if you were in the same situation, that would not be the assumption you would jump to. And it makes you wonder, why would you jump to that assumption? And I think the reason, and it's supported by some of the things Karen says, is Karen, for whatever reason, thought she might have hit John the night before. She's going to say that repeatedly. In fact, I think... Even Karen's strongest supporters don't deny that she said things like, did I hit him? Could I have hit him? In fact, that was the alternate story told by the defense when people testified that she said, I did hit him. And you have to wonder, why would she think that? It's not hysteria. And that's what most people say. Well, she was hysterical because she was worried. Why? Why is she so worried about this grown man that she dropped off at a party? Why is she assuming the worst. Literally no one else is, including Karen, who we talked about earlier, who's not part of the conspiracy. Nobody thinks she is. She wasn't thinking, well, if he didn't come back, he must be dead on the side of the road. But that apparently is Karen's first thought. And it's sad that his niece had to testify about that. So after the kids testified and they testified off camera because they're minors, 
So we're relying on reporting about what they said. After the kids was Dr. Justin Rice. He treated John. He said that John was 80 degrees, his body temperature by the time he reached them, which obviously is very cold. He noted that per EMS reports, John could have been struck by a vehicle. This confirms, by the way, something that was said earlier by a first responder. One of the first responders, and I forget which one, when he was asked by the defense, did you put this in a report, said, well, I told it to the doctor. And the defense attorney, I think it was Yanetti, said, isn't this the first time you've ever said that? The first time you've ever said you told a doctor that is in front of this jury trying to say he's making it up on the spot. Well, here, much later, which once again, why this took weeks <laughs> to come out, I don't know. That's a choice by the prosecution. You have this doctor who was essentially saying, yeah, that's exactly what happened. These people came in with him and said he might have been struck by a vehicle. Now, the defense, they, on cross-examination, they talked about John having no injuries below the neck. The doctor explained that they would not have actually recorded injuries that were not connected to resuscitation and saving his life. So they would be looking for injuries that would have been life-threatening. During the autopsy, it's not as if he has no injuries. Does he have injuries that would be consistent with, say, him standing up and being backed into by a car? No, but it's not exactly accurate that he has no injuries below the neck. If for nothing else, his arm is is very injured, and this is important. So then we have Dr. Gary Faller. He is one of the doctors who was there when Karen Reed came in, and based on a blood draw at that time, remember she went to the hospital because there was some concern that she might injure herself. She was given a blood draw, and her alcohol level at that time, that morning, was just at the legal limit. After this, she would have Nicholas Roberts who would testify and he's sort of going to take this information and work backwards to try and establish just how intoxicated Karen was the night before. And he would say that if she had nothing else to drink since 1230, she would have been between 0.13 and 0.29 at that time. The defense is going to say, of course, well, you don't know whether she had anything else to drink. And if she did, that would ruin your estimates, which is true. However, later on, we're going to have some pretty detailed testimony about just how much Karen drank. And... I think this is a fairly good estimate of where her blood alcohol level would be. We're going to learn much later that John's blood alcohol level at this time was around 0.2 and would have been higher at the time that he was struck. I think it's fair to say that Karen was very drunk at the time. And this is consistent with what Karen told both Jen McCabe and Carrie Roberts, that she was in fact so drunk that she didn't actually remember anything from the night before. Then you're going to have Louis Jutris, who testifies he's going to be used to introduce some footage from the town library between 12 a.m. and 1. Around midnight, you see an SUV matching Reed's is on Washington Street. And this is just to show that this was the path she took. There's going to be various cameras that are introduced. There's going to be, quote unquote, missing camera footage. Most of these cameras are motion activated and frankly, just don't always catch motion. We have this problem. When we're trying to track vehicles, we'll often want to get ring camera footage. And our investigators will often tell us that the chances of those cameras actually picking up anything driving by is low. Because that's not how they work. Unless they're continuously running, they're not necessarily going to catch a car driving by. And you see some of this in this case. Yeah, absolutely. It's easy to see how missing quote-unquote footage could be fit into this deletion conspiracy theory but really if you have a ring camera you've probably seen this there's some element of filter where they decide how close the motion has to be for the recording to actually activate and because of this a lot is not actually caught Okay, next on the stand is Kevin O'Hara. He's a state police lieutenant, and he worked for the Special Response Unit. Now, he said that they arrived around 5 p.m. to begin a grid search of the area where John was found. Of course, a grid search is exactly what it looks like, where you work methodically, so John's body has been taken away. You know, resuscitation efforts are kind of paramount when you first get there. But now that kind of all the hubbub has died down, they're going, you know, square by square to make sure they cover everything. Remember, this is the same day. The weather conditions are still pretty horrid. But even so, 
Kevin O'Hara testified that they found multiple pieces of red and clear tail light, six or seven pieces, in fact, and they found the sneaker that John was missing. Remember, he showed up at the hospital with just one shoe. Now, all of the items had been buried in the snow, and he said that they searched for about an hour and 15 minutes until 6.15 p.m., and even at that time, they figured they hadn't found everything at the scene, and they told officers as much, but the lighting was bad, the weather was bad, and so they called off the search for that night, thinking they would come back, which they do later. But it's important to note, by 5 p.m. that night, they are finding multiple pieces of red and clear taillight. Yeah, it's, a, it's really important. And this is this is a fact that was just missed or intentionally ignored by a lot of people following this case. We have people, there have been a lot of arguments about this case in the gallery, and one person claimed that the taillights were found weeks later. And it's like, no, that's not true. They weren't. Taillight pieces were found that very day, starting at 5 p.m. in the middle of this blizzard, before, by the way, Proctor would have been around, before anyone would have been able to plant these. How exactly you would plant taillight pieces underneath a foot of snow in the middle of a nor'easter? I don't know. And in fact, despite the fact that people want to ignore that these taillight pieces were found there, the defense is eventually going to have to address this. And one of their witnesses they're going to call is going to be an expert who is going to sort of recreate a scenario where, in fact, John is so mad at Karen that night that he throws his drink glass, the one that shattered, at her car, shatters her tail light, and that's what causes the pieces to be dispersed the way they are. And I think you should take it seriously that the defense felt the need to explain how those pieces got there, because they weren't planted. Even if, you know, you want to think that later pieces were planted to seal the deal, the fact of the matter is pieces of her tail light were found at that house that day before anyone could have been involved in planning this evidence. So this is incredibly important testimony from someone who no one thinks is involved in the conspiracy and would have no reason to be involved in the conspiracy. And they're already finding things that are consistent with this being, or at least Karen's SUV being damaged at the scene. However you think it happened, it being damaged at the scene and that tail lot being damaged there, finding things that are consistent with that. I mean, honestly, again, hindsight 2020, all the last, I don't know how many weeks of testimony we had heard. If I were to do it again, I would basically start here. Talk about the hard evidence about what's happening with the taillight, what's being found then. We're about to get into some other forensic science of like hard facts that are very damning for Karen Reed. And remember, the jury's been sitting there for weeks at this time. This is the first time they're hearing about all this. And this is very difficult for the defense to overcome. I don't care what your defense theory is. These forensic evidence items that you're about to hear are difficult for the defense. And so if I were them, I would have started here and then maybe backtrack and start talking about the humanization of who John O'Keefe is. But when you hear about basically how this hit happened, it doesn't it does matter who John is, but it doesn't matter who it is. Whoever got hit in this manner, it's horrid once you hear the evidence. And it just seems incredibly black and white. And so I don't know why they waited so long to get here. But we're getting the the kind of view of starting this episode with all of this evidence. I would have put episode, what is this, seven at number one in the evidence presentation. And I forget what day this is. I mean, you should watch this testimony because like it's really important. 16, but it's way down the 20, line. I think it's 20, actually. <laughs> And the thing is, you got to remember, and I don't, you know, we're trying to get through this. So I don't want to dwell on this too much, but this is important. So I want to talk about it. <laughs> Juries are like everybody else. They begin to form their idea of what happened pretty early on. And it can change and it can develop as the trial goes on. And they're instructed to hear all the evidence, but they're human beings. And human beings start to have an idea. And if you spend the first 15 days of your testimony putting on witnesses, and it's going to be, do, are, was there a conspiracy or was there not? And you've got the defense doing these like incredibly difficult cross examinations where they're like Perry Masing this with every single witness. And you got the jurors with really no reason at that point, other than some of the things she said to believe that Karen Reed is involved in this. And they're hearing all this stuff. They're starting to have doubt. Then they're starting to think, well, man, I don't, I don't believe this conspiracy, but this is some weird stuff. 
Or maybe they're saying, huh, I think those people were involved. And once those things become concrete in their mind, then it's harder to get them off of that. You're like fighting an uphill battle. So I agree with Alice 100%. I think, you know, do the finding of the body, put on a witness or two that heard her say, did I hit him or I hit him? And then go immediately into the evidence that he was hit. And then if you want to do everybody else at the end, feel free or just let the defense do it. You know, I mean, make them put on 20 days of conspiracy theory, because if it takes them 20 days to explain the conspiracy theory, that's not a great look for them. Right. And here's the thing. We talked about playing on your own turf and not being too reactionary when you're the prosecution. This is like the best rebuttal to a conspiracy theory. The hard evidence of we'll get to it. John's DNA all over the back of Karen Reed's broken car. Okay, so we'll we'll jump into this evidence then. So Maureen Hartnett is a forensic scientist who testifies, and she examined Karen's trunk door. She testified that there were scratches on the rear bumper, a dent in the trunk door, a broken taillight, an apparent hair, and a piece of glass on the bumper, all likely there because it had frozen there. Note, if this is due to John getting mad at Karen and throwing a cocktail glass at her car to break the taillight, how do you explain the scratches on the rear bumper, the dent of the trunk door, and the taillight, and his hair on it, as well as the glass being stuck to the bumper? That's some, like, Travis Kelsey-style ball-throwing over there, right? (laughs) This is important, though, right? (laughs) Thank you. I just had to throw that in there. (laughs) Sports ball. Sports ball. I'm really good at this. Don't you worry about it. So this is important because she's looking at the holistic picture of that trunk. This is hard to fit into the story of the defense saying, oh, John threw that glass at him. Riddle me that. Riddle me the rest of the damage to this SUV that is quite difficult to dent and leave marks behind. Now, she testified that the hair found on the back of Karen's car was a human hair, and she swabbed the damaged areas of John's shirt to see if it was consistent with a dog. Here's where they're being reactionary and responding to the whole Chloe theory that Chloe, the German shepherd from the Albert's home, attacked and killed John or was part of the killing of John, part of this conspiracy theory. And she determined that there was no dog DNA on John. She also checked his clothes for dog saliva under a special light and found none. I do think you probably at some point want to put that on. I may save that for like a rebuttal witness because I don't think I want to put it in my case in chief and give any credence to the Chloe theory. I may make them say, hey, look at this German shepherd who killed this man and all he left behind were these little tiny marks all over his arm. Make them present that ridiculous theory and on rebuttal in a sigh while I look at the ceiling after I've just talked about how this amazing man took in his orphan niece and nephew and his DNA is splattered all over the back of Karen Reed's damaged SUV and say, yes, Dr. Hartnett, can you please explain if you ran any tests on the deceased's clothing to look for dog DNA? Uh, Yes, I did. Can you please tell the jury if you found anything? No, not at all. Dog hair? No. Dog saliva? No. Your Honor, we pass the witness. That's what I would do, because I would say so few words to make their theory look like trash that it is. Instead, when you put it in your case in chief, you seem so offensive that you have to respond before they've ever even really put on any evidence that Chloe is this murderous dog. That's a better strategy, I think, in storytelling. And that's exactly what they should have done. The defense is going to put an expert to talk about how she thinks the wounds look like dog bites. And there's no rebuttal to that. And in their mind, I think the state, the Commonwealth is thinking, well, we already addressed that. And I'll address in the closing. No. Call the witness and ask three questions, like Alice said, and just show, like, okay, she looks at it, she sees dog bite. Well, this person actually did science and found no dog DNA. That's a much better way to do it. But the prosecution is falling all over itself to try and rebut this conspiracy theory, and they're just making it. Like Alice said, they made the conspiracy theory for the defense. The defense didn't have to put on any conspiracy theory witnesses. I mean, they put on the snowplow driver, which I guess is kind of one. But that's it. The conspiracy theory was already made for them by then. And this is not second guessing because in real life, it felt like a mistake. 
And we talked about that. But that that was the path that they chose. Okay. So we keep moving on. Ashley Valier, I forget how to pronounce her name. She is another forensic analyst. She is actually the person who put the pieces back together with the broken tail light to sort of form the tail light. They were never able to find all the pieces, which I think is interesting and important for a couple reasons. Number one is we're going to learn. John actually had pieces of the tail light on his shirt. And number two, one of the things that's going to trip up one of the prosecution witnesses is a piece of tail light was found pretty far away. And based on his reconstruction, he's trying to include that tail light in the accident. And I think what he ignored, and I'm not sure why he did ignore it, it was really windy that day. And tail light pieces are the kind of things that in the wind might move around. And I think it's probably likely that some of those tail light pieces were never found because they were dispersed. And that piece of tail light, which was off far away from everything else, was probably dispersed as well. But this person is going to show that not all the tail light pieces were recovered, but nevertheless, the ones that were, were from the broken tail light. Then you have Christina Hanley. She is another forensic analyst. She's going to match some of the glass fragments to the broken cocktail glass. Now, some of the pieces of glass that they found could not be matched. This is also not that surprising just because there's a lot of debris and detritus everywhere. We run into this problem sometimes with shootings where there'll be a shooting, you know, and we know five shots were fired and we'll find 20 shell casings because they're from prior shootings. <laughs> and so figuring out which shell casings are related to which shooting can be difficult. And it's actually pretty valuable for the defense attorneys because they'll try and say, how do you know that these shell casings that match my defendant's gun were actually from that shooting? You found 20 other shell casings. So the fact that they found extra glass isn't really that surprising to me. Now, the most important thing that Christina did was she examined trace material recovered from John's clothing. Embedded in those clothes were clear plastic material and red plastic material, some as small as one sixteenth of an inch or shorter. That's 1.5 millimeters for our international listeners. So very small pieces of tail light. The material was consistent with both the red and clear plastic of the tail light. <sighs> Guys. Karen Reed's broken taillight was embedded into his clothing in basically smushed form. Make the defense respond to that. You go back to that over and over. You present it like within the first day of trial. You have it in your opening and then you make them respond to it. We're talking, I mean, think about something that's been crushed, right? Not just broken, not just like shards. I've broken glasses all the time at home. We're talking about you broke the glass on the floor and then you step on it and it like grinds into the bottom of your shoe. I don't wear shoes in my house. Neither does John O'Keefe. But that's what we're talking about. Tiny bits embedded into his clothes. That's a bad fact for the defense. And they really get a pass. I, I think if you do this over again, there's a lot you can talk about because the way this was presented allowed the defense to gloss over some of the most damning evidence against Karen Reed because they had basically let the story of their defense take a life of its own. And because that was the framework by which the trial was running, all the other stuff didn't fit on that framework. So it didn't matter. You have to rebuild this framework. Build a framework around the hard forensic evidence of Karen's car being all over John O'Keefe's body. And that's the framework. Fit that conspiracy within the framework. Then you begin to see how the conspiracy doesn't physically fit into that framework. And then you completely change the framework of how the jury thinks about the case. It's one thing to get John's DNA on the tail light, which we also have. It's another thing to try and come up. How did they do this embedding of these tiny pieces of tail light into the clothes? I mean, what a brilliant thing to think to do to if you're doing the conspiracy, if you're a proctor and this is part of the conspiracy that you're like with tweezers taking very small pieces and, and jabbing them into the clothes to make it fit. And the amazing thing, and once again, the absolute failure of the prosecution, the number of people who don't even know about this. I mean, the number of people, once again, I'm going by the gallery, who did not know that there were pieces of the tail light found in John's clothes. A lot of them. A lot of people didn't know that. People thought that was made up. 
<laughs> and and you have testimony from this person who once again, even under your most generous theory, is not part of the conspiracy. At worst, someone else planted this on these clothes for her to find. But she's finding this. And these are the things the defense was fantastic when it came to the people who were at the house, cross examining them, making them seem suspicious, creating for the jury and for the person who's watching this vast movie like conspiracy murder on the Orient Express where all these people are involved in this for some reason. But when it came to this stuff, they really didn't have a whole lot to say. Because what do you say about this? You sort of imply, well, maybe Proctor was involved. That's the best you can do. It's just hope that Proctor and his the things he's going to do and the things he's going to say are going to carry your water for you. And the jury is going to believe, well, I know this is damning, but can I really trust it because of Proctor's involvement? That's the best you can do. This is devastating for the defense. But like Alice said, it is such a minor piece of the prosecution's case. It is something they barely talk about. And you just want to beat your head against the wall <laughs> that this was not more of a focus and that this wasn't the focus of the prosecution's case. So now we have Trooper Buhinnick. Now He received a call at 644 a.m. that morning telling him there was a body in a snowbank. He called Proctor, which I think is interesting I'm not exactly sure why Proctor was the one he called, but Buhinnick is the first guy involved. He's the one who brings Proctor into it. So it's just lucky, I guess, for the conspirators that Proctor does get involved. They meet at the Kent police station around 9.15 a.m. Now, what's interesting about this is how much Proctor and Buhinnick are doing not at the scene. They're not at the scene to influence witnesses. They're not at the scene to plant evidence. They're not able to do that during this period because they're doing other things. Now, he and Proctor are together. They go and speak with the McCabes and Brian Albert. They go to the hospital where they collect John's clothing. They notice there are traces of vomit on that clothing. One thing they note, or one thing Buhinnick notes, is that the clothing is kept separately from the things that were collected at Fairview Road. This was a rumor sort of going around before the trial that the police had just put all the evidence together, which, of course, they didn't do and wouldn't do, but I guess this was sort of... You know, if they threw the pieces of the tail light in with his clothes, maybe there was transfer, and that's how it became embedded in his clothing. But that didn't happen. They then go to Karen's parents' home. They arrive there around 2.30. Now, they sit around and wait a while for the local police to arrive because they want them there. And while they're there, they note that Karen's SUV, which is in the driveway, has a damaged rear tail light. Reed is interviewed. She says that she drank vodka soda the night before. She said she didn't leave McCarthy's with a beverage, which we now know was a lie. She said she dropped O'Keefe off at Fairview Road, but she never saw him walk into the Alberts' house, which is an interesting comment. I mean, just going back to the... She puts herself there. She puts herself, she puts herself there, there. Which is different than what she said even earlier that day when she said, I left him at the Waterfall Bar. Exactly. And exactly. But now she's remembered that she dropped him off. But interestingly, she doesn't say that she saw him go in the house, which is a mistake for her going back to the whole search of the home. We talked about probable cause. And some of you still think they had probable cause. So we'll take a minute to discuss that now. Here. She could have created probable cause, if y'all. Said, it would have been a lie. But she could. She she's she's over here being like they should have searched. She was the probable cause. She Absolutely. Not giving her tips here, but guys, she you can't said, cry about it when you are the link. If she had said, I saw him walk into that house. Boom, probable I mean, cause. That's really valuable because what's the problem? We talked about this before. Your best case for probable cause is they knew him. They saw him earlier. He was supposed to come over and he ends up dead in the front yard, right? That's your basis for probable cause. But the issue you have is in order to search the house, you need something to show you're going to find or, or, or likely to find evidence in the house. And there's no one that puts him in the house. Even Karen doesn't put him in the house, which is another reason, by the way, why this is a problem. Assume for a second that those four things get you probable cause, even without him going to the house. Assume that that establishes probable cause. Well, then you come back to your Frank's problem, the Frank's motion. Think about Delphi. Keep coming back to Delphi because you guys know Delphi. I know you do. In the Delphi case, there's an argument that the Evidence from the search of Richard Allen's house should be thrown out because the police did not include exculpatory evidence about an Odinist cult active in the area that could have been involved in the death 
of the girls. And basically the argument the defense is making is if you put that in there, that defeats the probable cause that you've established with the other things that you've included. The problem you have here is even if you think those factors I just mentioned get you to probable cause, you immediately have Karen saying things like, I hit him, I may have hit him, whatever you prefer it to be, I may have hit him. Let's just say it's that. Did I hit him? Could I have hit him? Imagine it's that. You've got her saying that. You've got the damage to the tail light. You've got her saying he never went inside. You've got the police finding tail light pieces in the snow. You've got the broken cocktail glass. You have all these things that point away from something happening in the home, which is the reason that you never would have been able to get a search warrant for that house. And you certainly wouldn't have been able to get a search warrant for their phones when there's even less evidence connecting the phones to the crime. So this is just another point where if the police were even contemplating a search warrant, this is defeating that even as they're talking to Karen Reed. So she says that she dropped him off. She didn't see him go inside. She decided to leave because she was having stomach issues and she decided she did not want to attend the party. She said she made a three point turn and left. The police would pull footage from the driveway camera at the parents' home and they actually saw Reed and her father pull into the drive and then they spent some time looking at that rear tail light, the one that's damaged. The vehicle would eventually be towed back to the Canton Police Station and eventually would be turned over to the state police. Okay, so now going into karen's state of mind and how much she was drinking the night in question now there's video shown of karen drinking we've already talked about this we've seen some of it she gets a cocktail glass from the bartender when she arrives at the bar and okay maybe some of you do but most people do not start the night with water and a cocktail glass so this is likely a drink but then she gets a second drink and a shot that she pours into the glass also, presumably not water, because if she was, why get it in a small shot glass? Why pour it into a bigger glass? If it was all water, just fill me back up. Then she gets another drink and another shot that she pours into that drink. So we're up to five drinks in a very short period of time. All told, we see Karen with nine drinks. So even if one or two are water, that's a lot of drinks in a relatively short amount of time. And I would say her BAC matches kind of that drinking pattern that night. On February 3rd, the crime scene techs are back at Fairview. I understand why the defense has to push back on this. They need to force the Commonwealth to prove it. I mean, some of the charges are that she was drunk. So absolutely push back on this, force them to prove it, raise every bit of reasonable doubt you can raise. The fact of the matter is she was drunk and we all know it. So we should just accept that. <laughs> She's definitely drunk. Everybody's drunk. And you can tell everybody's drunk because they say that neither Karen nor John seem drunk. They were both really drunk. All these people were drunk. That affects this case. It affects Karen. And as I've said before, the interesting thing about the drunkenness is the second degree murder is really affected by how much she drank. If you think Karen Reed was that drunk, it's really hard to prove second degree murder. So it's interesting the defense is in this very difficult place where they want to push back on this notion that she had so much to drink. But on the other hand, it is kind of helpful for them for the most serious charge that she's facing. So on February 3rd, the crime scene techs are back at Fairview. They were specifically looking for John's hat and they found it along with a drinking straw from the waterfall bar. And they found more plastic at that time from the tail light. Note, it's not that they're finding the taillights for the first time now. They're finding more taillight. They found taillight the very day that John's body was found. Remember, we heard from the police officer who searched at 5 o'clock with the grid search, but he only searched for about an hour. Since that time, snow has melted. And so things which were previously covered are now viewable. So additional taillight was found at this time. Now, ring camera footage from the O'Keefe home was also pulled. Weirdly, it didn't show events after 1130 the night of John's death until Karen is pulling out and maybe bumping John's car around 5 a.m. So there's kind of this hole in between. This led to the speculation that that period of time video footage was deleted. Honestly, it could also just be one of many tech quirks in this case. So we're giving benefit of the doubt to both sides. You know, the defense was saying, oh, the prosecution has deleted all this footage or 
you know, flipped mirror imaged footage and whatnot. Here, you could also say that it would be very convenient if Karen deleted video of her showing up after midnight with a broken taillight. We don't have that footage. But honestly, it could have just been that this is motion detected and the ring camera didn't capture it. Now, on cross-examination, the defense focused on the fact that the troopers didn't search the Albert home. We've talked about this ad nauseum. We're not going to talk about it even more. And they were also asked about where John O'Keefe's clothes were kept. This implied that the clothes had been tampered with by the police. They have to do this, remember, because there's really bad evidence for Karen in those clothes. Now, the defense, other than asking questions about it and implying that there's some sort of bad actions on the part of the police, there's not really evidence of it. So they're suggesting it with their questioning, but that's just an argument that they're trying to make. The defense also harped on the Sally Port video being mirrored. So this honestly was a very embarrassing time for the prosecution. And basically the left was the right, the right was the left. This matters because one of the taillights was broken and that's the one they wanted to focus on. And this allows the defense to suggest that someone tampered with the taillight without the camera catching it because of the mirror image. They also suggest video from various places was deleted, but Buhenik explained that these cameras were motion triggered as we've discussed. And, you know, it, the mirrored video thing is something that people focused on a lot. Definitely an embarrassment and a mistake. I, I don't quite understand how if you had seen it flip the other way, it's not as if you would see the other side of the car. You know, if you're on a Zoom call, you can flip the way your Zoom is mirrored so that like the words behind you read the way they're supposed to. It's not like it shows your back, right? So it's not like by flipping it, they covered up what was happening on the other side. Now, what it does make you think is that you're looking at the passenger side and you're actually looking at the driver's side. So it's not great, but I think some people have taken it a little bit farther than they should. Now, what it definitely shows, once again, is the sloppiness of this investigation. And there was some sloppiness. And I think one of the things this case illustrates really well is number one, there are always going to be mistakes. Number two, the police really did not go the extra mile in this case, which you would think they would have because there was a brother officer involved, but they just didn't. And there are a lot of places where by not taking the next step, they give the defense an argument. And it's unfortunate. It's lots of things like the ring camera footage being deleted it just feels like they they asked Ring about it and Ring said, oh, we don't really know. We can't really find it. I don't believe that. I think you probably could figure that out. Her car, the telematics on her car, there aren't any. I don't believe that. I think this this reminds me of the Murdoch case where the state asked for the telematics on his car. And initially they said they didn't have any. And then like right before trial, they found it. I think that's out there. And I think it would have been very helpful. But they didn't take that extra step. And if you want to criticize the police, other than for the obvious we're about to get to, I think you can criticize them for just not doing everything they could have done. And while normally I sort of give the police a pass on that, because as I've said many times, you never know which case is going to be the case. It turns out to be a big deal. And so maybe you don't take every step you should take, even when you should they take knew. it. <laughs> they this knew. one they should have known. And so it's, it's disappointing that that's what you got. And it allowed very good defense attorneys to point out all of the issues that the police had. And it allowed that conspiracy theory to have the air of, oh, here we go again, Massachusetts police. You know, we don't trust them anyway, and, and they're right back on it. So then you have Nicholas Barrows, who testifies. He was present when the SUV was towed from Reed's parents' house. He testified that the rear tail light was already broken at the time, which is a problem for the theory that it was later broken at the police station. Now, he described it as not completely broken, which is a little bit of a window for the defense because they can say, well, maybe they broke it some more at the police station so they could go back and plant some more of those pieces at the scene. But he also noted that there was snow caked on it. And when you look at pictures of the car from that day, you can see this snow. It was caked on the rear of the vehicle. And he is he is one of the witnesses who is not cross-examined. So that was a little interesting because I think they could have gotten something out of him, but they don't cross-examine him. So we move on. To the next witness, who was, without question, probably 
I'm not going to say probably, just without the question. Downfall the of most the case. important. The downfall of the case, let's be witness, honest. Witness, and in many ways, the downfall of the case. And that is Michael Proctor. And Michael Proctor is the lead investigator on this case. He was brought in, as we said, by Buhinnick. You know, the beginnings of his testimony are very ordinary. He repeats much of the story that Buhinnick has already said. He talks about how the SUV arrives at the Canton Police Garage just after 5.30 p.m. This is important. This is, will be lost in everything else that he says. But it's important because the grid search, the one that found the taillight pieces, had already begun at the Alberts' home at 5 o'clock. So it would not have been possible for him to have gotten those taillight pieces and planted them at the home for the other investigators to find before this car was was brought in. So that is an important thing. And once again, explaining those taillight pieces is something the defense is going to be so concerned about, they're going to have a witness who is going to talk about it. Now, Proctor does say that he was friends with Julie and Chris Albert, as well as Colin Albert. He'd worked a case with Kevin Albert a few years before, which is going to lead to a very embarrassing story about Kevin Albert. You may remember that Kevin Albert works for the Kent Police Department as a detective. He talks about how they had gone out to dinner after they had done this. Kevin got drunk. He ended up leaving his badge and possibly his gun in Proctor's car. He would text him later to ask him if he had seen his gun anywhere. <laughs> that is... <laughs> I'm yes. sorry, it has nothing to do Alice's with the case. Face over but here. it's just like... <laughs> Gosh darn it. Yeah. Y'all. That's really bad. That's really it's, bad. it's really bad. <laughs> yeah. You don't lose your gun. That's like cardinal uh, rules. Okay, officer. sorry. To explain the face palm, this just feeds into the incompetent police. They don't know what they're doing. They're using solo cups and bagging clothes in the wrong areas. This just feeds into that narrative when you're like, hey man, you see my gun? You don't lose your gun and leave it somewhere when you're a police officer. Yeah, but he did. So... He talks about how Julie was friends with his sister and would babysit. He said that they were about 10 years older than him. Colin is about 20 years younger. He called them acquaintances, his sister's friends. And look, it's not great that he knows these people. I thought this came across as pretty believable that he's friends with these people, but it's not like he's ride or die with these people. He's not as close to these people as some others are. But nevertheless, he has this connection and it's going to be a problem for the investigation, particularly given what he decides to do. And what he decides to do is we started this episode with talking about how careful we are with our phones. Some of us don't even trade in our phones to get the $100 value credit, and we may hammer the phone. He instead uses his phone as his broadcasting tool and texts so many inappropriate things and the prosecution really has to face this head on, and they do. So during the direct, they talk about text messages in a group chat with his friends. And Proctor says he told his friends about the accident and that the person who died, John, was a cop. Now, one of the people on this text chain said the owners of the house where John was found would definitely receive some shit. But Proctor responds, nah, the owner is also a Boston cop. He went on to say that Karen Reed had hit John O'Keefe with her car, and that's how John ended up at the hospital. He said that Karen was a babe, but also a terrible word that starts with a C, with no ass. Proctor said the messages were unprofessional. <laughs> that's like understatement of the year. And he testifies, yes, I should not have sent them. And I mean... Look, go watch his testimony if you want, because they go through these texts in detail. And there are many, 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 many awful things that he writes about Karen Reed that we will not repeat here because, I don't know, we'll get kicked off every podcast platform because it's that, that terrible, right? I'm not excusing anything he says. It's as bad as you think. It was beyond poor judgment for him to put this in text and on his personal phone to people who are not part of the investigation, who shouldn't know anything about this stuff. And also he's talking about like a subject of his investigation. This is beyond unprofessional, beyond unethical, and just on a human level, incredibly crass, incredibly disgusting, and just horrible, horrible. Maybe other people talk like this regularly. I don't really know that many people who text this 
terribly. <sighs> I'm making you answer for him. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, look, I'm not going to defend him at all because I don't think he can be defended. I think there are we're not even done, but no, there are so many done. issues. Number one, why is he talking to people who are not in the police department about an open investigation? As bad as this stuff is, as bad as, you know, from a PR perspective of what he said is, that is really bad. Why are you doing that? You're not supposed to do that. That's a violation of, of everything you're supposed to do. Number two, the fact that he says the things he says, number one, I hate this cowboy crap. I hate it so much. And you see cops do this. This thing about how, like, the owners aren't going to receive any crap because he's a Boston cop, too. Now, look, maybe that's him saying, I'm going to engage in a conspiracy to cover this up so that nothing happens to them. But what it sounds to me like is macho BS. Him, like, strutting around for his friends about how, no, that's not going to happen because he's a cop and I'm a cop, too. I hate that stuff. I hate that stuff. And you see it all the time, and it drives you crazy. The third thing that's problematic is he's saying all this stuff about Karen Reed early on, including the fact that he thinks she hit John with the vehicle. Now, look, there's evidence for that. But obviously, when you do that, what is it going to do? It opens you up to accusations that you prejudged the case, that you're engaged in tunnel vision, that you ignored evidence to the contrary, and that you can't be trusted as an investigator to follow up leads. And it's important that you be able to trust. When an investigator tells you, we didn't search the house because we didn't have probable cause, you want to believe that. You want to believe you can believe him, that that was his professional judgment. If the only person saying that was this guy, you couldn't believe it because he's made it very clear that it doesn't matter. In his own words, it doesn't matter. He's not going to search that house. Now, look, there's other reasons to think they couldn't have, but he's replaced that with the macho BS. Everything he did was was a violation of his solemn duty as a cop. And don't try and defend it because you shouldn't. He should be held to a higher standard. Now, look, could he have these feelings about someone he thought killed a fellow officer? Absolutely. And Every officer feels this way. The cop who arrests a guy who rapes and murders a six-year-old, guess what? He's got some very negative views about that defendant. He feels a certain way about that defendant. But most of those cops are so professional, and it's always amazing to watch interrogation videos with police officers who you know despise the person they're talking to because of what they did and how professional they act and how they carry themselves because that is their job. And Proctor fell down on on his job. He damaged this case. And it may very well be that a police officer will never get justice because of his actions. And he should be held to account for that. And it is so frustrating to see something like this in this case. Absolutely. There have been a lot of bad things said about a lot of law enforcement in this case. He deserves it. <laughs> The other guys, not so much, but it stinks because someone like him gives the rest of cops the bad name because you can look at him and read the text that he sent. And we're not done. And we're not going to let him off the hook here because one of his duties as the investigator is to go through Karen's phone, which he's doing. But at some point he finds like some attorney client privilege material. So he has to turn it over. And in doing so, he noted in this cowboy crap manner, nope, didn't find any nudes on her phone. Okay, clearly that is a, a not funny joke. You guys have heard me talk about how people like to take naked pictures on their phones, and I've seen a lot of them in lots of cell phone dumps. It's crass. It's disgusting. I don't joke about it. When I see it, I don't want to see it. But he's basically being a cowboy because he is looking at a woman's phone, right? And he's trying to be like, oh, look what I get to do in my job. And he also says he hates the defense counsel, Yanetti. Again, a lot of police investigators and a lot of prosecutors have very strong feelings about defense counsel. Not appropriate to say it here. Honestly, this is the least bad of the things he says because it doesn't have to do with Karen Reed. Everything he says about Karen, just bad. So he also said he hoped. Now, this is this really does cross a line. This is not cowboy machoism. This is just he needs to get himself checked. He says he hoped Karen Reed would kill herself. This is where his emotions get the better of him. What Brett was saying, he's not carrying himself with any professionalism. He also said that Karen was a nut bug with a leaky balloon knot, referring to her Crohn's disease. So making fun of something she really can't control, which is 
an autoimmune disease. And I just want to say one other thing about this. You know, you might be thinking, well, what's the difference between thinking it and saying it? You know, if you think this, you could be biased to it. Okay, sure. Absolutely. But here's the thing. We've talked about this before. No one, not police, not prosecutors, not defense attorneys, not jurors, not judges. No one is without bias, preconceived notions, assumptions, everything else. But not putting this stuff into text is a sign that you can control your bias and you can act in spite of it and you can do your job in spite of it and you can control your emotions. And when you can't control your emotions and you can't control your bias, it is a legitimate question whether or not you can be trusted with the evidence in a case. Now, some of the things he's going to be accused of doing seem so far beyond anything he could do that it's silly, but it was absolutely appropriate for the defense to focus on him. The arguments about his bias were absolutely appropriate. It was absolutely appropriate for the jury to take this into account. Now, one thing I'll say about it, the power of Proctor's testimony is not so much what he says, because you hear these things and they're really bad, but there's not, you know, there's nothing in there about how he's going to make sure she's convicted, right? Things that lead you to think he's planning evidence or anything along those lines. And you can say, well, would he really put that in text? Not a great question to ask about Michael Proctor, because apparently he'll put anything in text, but there's nothing along those lines. So, you know, how far does this take you? I'm not sure. But the thing about Proctor is he gives you and he gives the jury permission to ignore logic and reason and to endorse emotion. He gives you a justification for essentially jury nullification. Jury nullification. <laughs> jury nullification. I mean, literally, I, I want to draw the distinction here, right? Because the things that he does, terrible, 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 terrible. You can take some of what he says, like the he's not going to get any crap because he's a Boston cop, as indications of conspiracy. But this is not a silver bullet of he's laying out the conspiracy plan because, first of all, he's not talking to the people who are alleged co-conspirators. So this is not actually like a floor plan of what the conspiracy is. But what it allows everyone to think is this is not OK. This is who is like supposed to be investigating this case. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth, and that bad taste is called jury nullification. That that bad that bad taste is something very different than reasonable doubt. Okay, those are two different things. Jury nullification, totally allowed by the jury, by the way. And when you have something this egregious, this is the specific type of thing that pushes jurors to want to do something like jury nullification. For those who may not know what jury nullification is, it's that the evidence is there and you may even believe that the person is guilty of who, what they're charged, but you don't think they should be convicted because, dang, these are some bad acts by the lead investigator. That's jury nullification. Not that you don't think the person did it or that the evidence shows they did it or the prosecution proved it. It's that you don't care. Despite all that, this guy, he's so dirty. He's so bad. He's so terrible. I don't even care. Let Karen go because she can go because Michael Proctor is horrible. That's jury nullification. Okay, so the defense suggested that it was Proctor and not Karen who deleted various videos from the ring camera. Talked about the deletions. It's hard to imagine why he would do this. Like, ring said that there was no digital footprint for who deleted the footage. I bet that actually exists somewhere. This goes along with him being so bad that you could just peg anything you want on him, right? Man, he's making fun of this woman for her autoimmune disease. He's making fun of her, you know, derriere and calling her words that you should never call anyone, a woman or otherwise, or someone you're investigating. He probably deleted video too, probably framed her for murder. He's probably capable of anything. He's probably Hitler himself. That's what the defense is getting the jury to think. And they can be led along with it because he's given them enough rope to hang himself. Jason Blair in the in the chat just mentioned Mark Furman, and that is so right. You know, Mark Furman and all the things he had said and done before the O.J. Simpson case allowed the jury to ignore the evidence because, you know, oh, bloody glove, Mark Furman probably planted it. No DNA in the car, probably Mark Furman. And you're going to see this from the defense again and again and again. Yeah, you know, when we're talking about Jen McCabe's phone. You know, why is it that when they do the forensic analysis, they don't actually find anything incriminating on her phone? Well, guess who had it first? 
Proctor. So he probably went in there and got rid of all the evidence. It's just pretty much everything. Oh, there's, well, maybe he took some tweezers and planted the taillight pieces in the clothes. I mean, you know, who knows? Maybe he washed the clothes, so there's no dog DNA on them. I mean, he he could be sort of pegged with anything, and it's just it is a whatever you want to call it, an on goal, a home run, a grand slam, slam dunk. I mean, it is just for the defense. It is a hugely valuable thing. And I do have a question for you, Alice. Where would you have put him in the case? Because this is a tough one. Where do you put him to minimize the damage that he's done? They've stuck him pretty much in the middle, which may be the best you could do. I think but what are your the thoughts best on you that? Could do. I think you start with all the forensic science because, what, again, what you've done is you've built the case and he doesn't affect that, right? There's so many other people. You have scientists, you have other people who have nothing to do with Proctor kind of analyzing the evidence, who see the taillight broken at 2.30 p.m. the day of, you know, well before the broken taillights are found at 5 o'clock. And then you stick them in the middle like you do a a crap sandwich, right? (laughs) You got really good evidence. You got the crap in the middle. And then you kind of end with the humanizing effects of who John is, what a great man he is. And then I would sandwich all of that, wrap all of that in with testimony at the beginning with, oh, my goodness, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. And with, oh, my goodness, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. That's what I would do is kind of bubble wrap him in the middle. You're not hiding him. That's how you deal with him. That's how I think because you don't want it to be the last thing the jury hears before they go deliberate. You don't want it to set the stage at the beginning. So I think he has to be in the middle. No, I think the middle is the best you can do. The middle is the best you can do. I don't know what else you can do. And that's where they put him. He's a problem. He's a problem, hands down. And you have to address this. So there's just not getting around it. And by the way, that shows you it's not a crooked prosecution. They didn't try to bury this. <laughs> they brought it all out. And it I don't is know how you could. Bad. You can't. You I mean, can't bury it. <laughs> the best you can do is front it and hope. Here's what I you have know. better next time is he's faced consequences since that time. Right? True. I mean, he said all the right quote unquote things, right? He's like, this is despicable. Shouldn't have said it. He did show remorse. I think it's real because he was facing real consequences for it. And they might need to take more serious actions because honestly if this is way, the way he runs this case he he runs other cases like this right like he's probably loose with his words in other cases and we've talked about this before you know giglio information is information that's detrimental that would lead you to believe an officer may be biased or may have committed improprieties in the past and it can destroy an officer's career and we have been really hard on him and that's justified but i will say part of me does feel bad for him because doing this he has destroyed his career he's done or he should be done as an officer in any in any serious capacity he cannot be trusted to run a case he cannot be trusted to testify because of this and you know whether that's fair or not and i think it probably is I nevertheless, I feel some some sympathy for the fact that this guy just totally blew himself up by being just a complete moron <laughs> on so many levels. And it may not just be this case that suffers because of it. Alice is absolutely right. This is not the only case he's handled. and This is not the only place I think this will come up. And that's the way it's going to be. And let me... Be clear about this. Again, this is not defending anything he's done, but I think everything and everything really was laid out in the open. All the texts were read, all of his, trust me, they dug into him, the defense did, right? Because this was their golden ticket to jury nullification and potentially a mistrial or acquittal. He was their silver bullet. So they, you know, they dug into him. So everything came out in this trial. It blew him up. It blew up his career. With all that said, horrible things. You've heard us say just how horrible it all is. I don't get crooked cop from this. I get incredibly stupid, unethical, poor, poor, poor judgment, probably shouldn't be a cop kind of guy. No, I agree. I I agree. I think I think if you want to argue tunnel vision, absolutely. I think I think that is perfectly legitimate. I, I don't get crooked cop either. I don't get I'm planning evidence to frame this woman. I get I really think this woman did this. And I hate her, and I'm going to let you know exactly how much I hate her. I get legitimate hatred of her, which leads to tunnel vision, I don't think implies that he framed her. So, you know, (laughs) the problem is, I don't know that most people watching or the jury get past, (laughs) as we've talked about, 
the emotion of hearing the terrible things he says to that point. Look, he's going to make no friends when he calls Karen Reed, no matter how you feel about her. You may dislike her greatly, but when you hear her called the C word, it's hard to come back from that, man. It's really hard to come back from that. We got a lot more to talk about, and and that's fine, because you guys love this case, right? I mean, that's the thing that, that we've learned, every, how much you love time, this case. Every time we have to do another episode, I cry and die a little on the inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like some of you are like, I wish you'd quit talking about this, but... Me too. But most of you. Me too. We yeah, have that in common. <laughs> Wait, but we're going to get through it, by goodness. Gosh, we're going to cover it, we the have whole to thing. Be so thorough. Why can't we just like cut loose? Because that's not the way we do it, Brett. You know, I was thinking about that. How like other podcasters would be like, well, "Let's move on," and like I can't not finish a book, no matter how much I hate it. I can't not finish writing. You know, like a brief. Like you don't just stop writing a brief. You got to finish your work. We're finishing our work here, guys. We are finishing our work for you. But I hope that this was informative for you if you're, you know, frankly sick of talking about the conspiracy theory and really wanted to know more about the prosecution's case. It would have been nice if the prosecution had put on more of its case a little bit earlier, but it chose not to do that. And that is something that I think can be analyzed and can be criticized. But we'll be back next week with more of this. Alice, I know we've got a little long, but do you want to do a question? We haven't done one in a while because these have been really long episodes. We can can absolutely do it. And look, I mean, y'all are passionate about this case, and I get it. I get that you're passionate about this case, but breathe a little. (laughs) I mean, it has been... We we have done some controversial cases. We did John Bonet Ramsey, and we did Adnan Syed, and those are like you know, the summer days compared to this. You know, it's just <laughs> those those are the good old days of everybody getting together. People <laughs> are as at each other's throats about the Karen Reed case as Should've... any case I've ever seen. And I really Which, don't understand it. I, I was going to say, honestly, I'm a little bit confused by the emotions. But, you know, follow your emotion, I guess. But keep it civil, y'all. OK, questions. OK, questions. <laughs> OK, I have an answer to this question. We'll see whether you do, Alice. This is from Miss Bananas. Miss Bananas wants to know, have you ever experienced interruption in the Matrix? Do you believe in this? Do you know what she's referring to? I I do. I knew. The glitch in the system. Yeah. I have a story. All the time. First of all. (laughs) Go. You. I want to hear your story. (laughs) No, if you've got a story. No, no. I want to hear your story. I want to hear your story. So back when I lived in Boston, my wife's probably watching this right now, and she knows exactly the story I'm going to tell. So I used to, I would take the red line into the city, and then I would take it back to, I can't remember, Porter Square. Porter Square. (laughs) I would take it back to Porter Square, and then I would walk back to Cambridge. And so I'm walking down Mass Ave, and it's this beautiful spring day. I mean, just a wonderful day. I can still feel it's, it's the nighttime, but I can feel like the wind on my face. And I'm walking down the street and there's a couple walking towards me and they have this beautiful black dog, just a great looking dog. And as, I, as I'm watching them walk past me, I'm looking at the dog and I'm thinking, wow, that's, that's a nice dog. What a nice night to walk your dog. So I continue to walk. So they walk past me headed towards Porter Square. I am walking towards Cambridge. I keep walking. About five minutes later, I kid you not, off in the distance, I see a couple, a perfectly lovely couple walking this beautiful black dog. And as I'm watching them and they get closer and closer, I'm like, those are the same people. That is the same dog. And so as I'm like getting closer and closer to them, I'm getting more and more freaked out. And I'm thinking, how could they have gotten around me? Like they, how could they have gotten to where they're now walking towards me? And I walk past them looking at the dog and I'm just like, I I have no explanation for this. And I stop and I go in a store and I actually call my wife at the time and I tell her what happened. I'm like, I do not understand this, but this this insane thing just happened to me. And from that point forward, we've always said that like there was some sort of slip, like I slid through to another universe or something. I mean, it was it was so bizarre. And I remember that to this day and I never forget it. And I can't explain it. Yeah. The world around me glitches all the time, but I think it's from lack of sleep. 
And it's never freaked me out because I just assume that my brain is glitching and it's not the world that's glitching. So I think it's slightly different. I see glitches all the time. I just assume the problem is me and not that we're in a, a universe of the Matrix. I'd be fine if we are, personally. <laughs> You'd be surprised, Alice. You'd be surprised. Who knows? If Does I anyone else's brain that... glitch like that, though? I might, like, you know, like that scene in the Matrix when there are the glitches? That happens in my brain when I haven't slept. And this is why I find the brain so fascinating, actually, because I do think our brain is like a matrix. So, like, the matrix is not that far-fetched because I think our entire brain, the way it works, is, in fact, the matrix. Because we've talked about how, like, your brain fills in different concepts and everything you perceive is actually an alternate re- – is, is AI anyways. Because it's your brain being, the, like, the highest functioning computer that we know. Except we only use, what, 20%. Well, I want you guys out there to write in your craziest I want to hear these glitches. Story. I want to hear it. It's going to be very, this is going to be an October episode. We will, I can feel it. Yeah, we will read the best ones on the show. So send them in. If you want to ask a question, leave a five star review. You can, you know, all the one star reviews we're getting from all the people who are very upset about our Karen Reed coverage, many of which will appear on TikTok very soon. You can help counter those with your five star review, asking a question that we will then answer live on air. So do that. If you have thoughts, comments for us, shoot us an email, prosecutorspod at gmail.com at prosecutorspod for all your social media. Thank you to everyone on Patreon and for our patrons who joined us tonight and have been with us. Throughout our coverage of the Karen Reed case, I promise you, it will end eventually, but not until we get to the bottom of this case. Right, Alice? We're not quitters. That's right. We're not quitters. Okay, Alice. Well, before we sign off, do you have anything else? Any other glitch stories you want to tell? No. <laughs> this whole Karen Reed trial feels like a glitch. So. <laughs> we'll be back. We'll be back. Yes. Come not join all our us. decisions are good <laughs> Don't ones, get angry so. at us for i don't know everybody's angry right, get angry <laughs> don't all be, you want. y'all smile smile a let little the bit. hate flow let, let the you. hate fuel your energy <laughs> <laughs> all right oh my goodness well, well this has been great brett this has been fun as always we'll be back next week but until then i'm brett and i'm alice and we are the prosecutors Going live. Going live. Okay. You know it's summertime because, like, you're right. It gets, like, hotter and hotter in the closet. Yeah. (laughs) And I was wondering, I was recording earlier today, and I was like, it was raining, and this is upstairs, and I was like, can you hear the rain on the recording? I don't know. I don't know. Time will tell. Time will tell. (laughs) It's not like I can't listen back, but... Okay. okay. I'm ready. Let's get through this. Ooh, let's do it. Why don't you just write a cookbook? Uh, I can't. It takes so much time. (laughs) I'd rather just give away my recipes for free. (sighs) Okay, but but learn learn it. You can put whatever dried fruit you want in it. Don't put dried mango. Dried mango is my favorite. I tried. Really? I failed. It burned. Mm. I think Uh, it it, caught on fire. (laughs) 